Okay, I'm going to remind you once again, if you're talking about this, that's great. If you're not, you're talking about other things, you're just stealing time from yourself. So just come in and be ready to go in this class, in this advanced class, this college level class. Okay? So who has um, something to say about the first one? And has a definite hand up. Yeah, okay. One, two. I realize don't have limit. Uh huh. But three does, but the answer does not show only three. So right? What's yeah. What's going yeah. on here? Okay. So that's good. Can I explain why there's no limit? Uh, okay. Explain why there's no limit. Well, let's see, because for one, there's a, what was that called? An asymptote. Okay. And so these two numbers are getting close to like the same number, but they're never going to which is technically infinity, mm -hmm. and infinity is never a real number, so that makes it no limit. Because infinity has no limit. Right. Okay. And then two, they're going to the obvious one is they're going to two separate uh, points. Mm -hmm. And three, even though there's a hole there, there's a hole there, they are both approaching the same point though. It's approaching the same point. Okay. So there's a hole, but they're approaching the same value, so the limit exists. You want to say what it is. So, th but that's not that's not a selection. Just three isn't a possible answer. Isn't two? It does exist because they're approaching different points, but there's holes, and the hole exists at hole. There is a wormhole. <laughs> so, what do we have to say about that? What about number two? Does the limit exist? Yes. Yes. Oh. What is the limit? Well, four. Mm -hmm. Three and a half. Three and a half. Anybody disagree with that? Aaron. Ryan. Okay, we got like five disagreements. Oh. Okay. Why does the limit exist? Condition. Oh, I heard. Mm -hmm. uh, I just because it approaches two different points and that's. Yeah. Just, uh, I can't. You know, okay, that's what Aaron said. Can't say much better than that. You do have to approach the same point, or the limit doesn't exist. Yeah. Here, from the right, sorry to draw a little arrow, we're approaching, okay, when, and when we say approaching, the, the value we're approaching, we mean the y value, okay? So the y value looks like maybe four and a half down here from the left. Clearly, we're not approaching four and a half. Mm -hmm. The graph does exist at three, and it looks like maybe it's at four. The y value is maybe four. But the definition of the limit is that the y value is the same as you come in from the right and from the left. Okay? So maybe you were pushed towards thinking the limit exists because 1 and 2, 1 and 2 is an option. And you know, uh, or no, 2 and 3 maybe. 2 and 3 is an option. You know 3 has a limit, and then you had to pick another one, and you thought maybe it was 2. Right? Um, we just displayed that. That can't be it. It doesn't have a limit. The limit has, there may be a hole, but the hole would have to just be the tiniest of gaps between what looks like a normal graph. So, so what do we say about that? Are we sure that there's no limit here for number two? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Anybody not convinced? Okay, we're all convinced, maybe reminded of, of what we felt in our gut was true but then we're confused by these answers. Anybody have to say anything, any, anything else to say about that whole thing? No? Okay. Um, well, if these are the possible answers, and we know three has a limit, this is definitely out, uh, this is definitely out, uh, anything that doesn't have three in it is out, um, well, two and three, gotta be out. Definitely two doesn't have a limit because you gotta approach the same value, okay? So I'm forced to conclude this is what they want me to answer. How can I justify that in my mind and what, about, what I know about limits? We mentioned it briefly last time. They both approach infinity. They both approach the same value, right? Quote, unquote, value. 
Um, and the argument can be made both ways. The limit exists in its infinity, or the limit doesn't exist because it doesn't approach a single value. Okay? So this is one, it's a little bit tricky. Uh, it depends who you ask, what side of the bed you woke up on that day, whether you want to say that there's a limit or there's not a limit. Okay? Um, but it could be said both ways. The limit doesn't exist because the graph increases without bound, or the, the, the function increases without bound. Or you could say the limit exists and that the limit as x approaches 3 of this function, this graph, is, is a <coughs> diagonal 8 is infinity. Ooh, it's really nice. Okay. So the argument can be made both either way. And since this is a, a, a possible answer, we're, we're solid on three. Three works. It's approaching the same value on the right and the left. Uh, so it must be one and three. Definitely not two and three, but we could say it's infinity, quote unquote. Okay. So now we look at this guy right here. We're just going to think about this function. Okay. The reason why these look so funny is because these are from practice AP tests already answering AP test questions. And I'm blocking out the pieces. This is the, the tricky part about taking the AP test, is mentally blocking out all the stuff that you don't, uh, maybe what you're trying to, uh, let's see. Trying to isolate it to what's actually being asked, okay? What's being asked here, the third part of number 27 on some practice test somewhere, it's asking you simply, what's the limit as x approaches 0? And is it 0? If it's something else, you'll say, no, it's not that. OK? Um, so for the function f of x equals x to the 1 third power, and since we don't have our calculators, because this has no calculators, um, what does the graph of x to the 1 third look like? Uh, oh, wait, wait. You, want, you said a graph? Just a general, like, how, how can we possibly answer this? If we don't have some notion of the graph or the function itself. When you have a number to a, to a third power, uh -huh. it's practically saying third to the cube root of x. Okay, yeah, this is the cube root of x, is equivalent, yeah. And if you just kind of like this, you can go and limit it if the x goes to zero, and from zero to the third, kind of to the third power. One third power. That's practically just going to get kind of Cube rooting zero, uh -huh. and when you cube, if you do any root of zero, that always equals zero. Okay, so the cube root of zero is zero, so that that feels fine, right? Mm -hmm. um, but what if something weird happened and, and that the function equals zero, but then the limit is something else, like this, like mm -hmm. this number three, right? The 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 function is this, but the limit is something else. Oh, could that happen? Yeah. It could happen. Does it happen to this function? Oh, no. oh. why not? It's exponential decay. Oh, wait, no, it's not exponential um, It's not exponential decay. Mm -hmm. Exponential functions have the exponent, or the variable in the exponent. Oh. Good guess, Kevin. Yes. Michael. Uh, but, okay, so it's not exponential decay. Is there anything you can't take the third root of? Negative number. Oh, yeah, you right. can do negative numbers. could take the negative numbers, right? The cube root of negative 8 is negative 2. Because if you multiply negative 2 by itself three times, you get negative 8. OK. Uh, positive numbers, of course, you can take the third root of that. 0, you can take the third root of that. So everything is in the domain of this function. Um, OK, so that's something to note. Does there seem to be any holes or jumping in this function? Or is it probably a nice? Like, Broke continuous, down. smooth graph. It is. OK. Um, if we take the third root of 0, we get 0. The third root of 1, we get 1. The third root of, uh, well, what would be the next one that makes sense? 9. 9? Third root of 9? Does 9 have a nice third root? 8 does. So we'd have to go all the way up to 8. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 to get to 2. 27. 27, that'd be way. 
way past the screen, right? And that would get us up to y equals three. So it's not getting very big very fast. It's, it's almost like it's leveling off, though we know it's not leveling off. We could get any y value we want. We just have to put in a really big x value to get to, say, 17. Right? Let's go all the way out to 17 cubed to get a y value of 17. Right? Agreed? OK. Um, well, it's like negative 1. The cube root of negative 1 is negative 1. Cube root of, well, we'd have to go all the way out here to negative 8. Yeah, that's good. Right? And go down here to get negative 2. So it looks something like that. Right? There's no reason, if you think about the cube root, for us to think that there's a hole in it or a jump or a vertical asymptote. Like, just, there's no problems here. We won't have a hole because there's no denominator at 0. We won't have any vertical asymptotes because similar reasoning. Uh, you can, everything's in the domain. So this is what it looks like. There are no holes, jumps, and it's the purple one. So the limit as x approaches 0 is zero. definitely 0. Okay. Yes. Yeah. The only reason why the limit wouldn't be 0, which is what Aaron got by just plugging 0 into the function, is if we had a function like this. Um, and there's lots of functions that are just nice and continuous, what we call continuous, no holes, no vertical asymptotes, we can just plug the value in, okay? We'll talk about several of those, and uh, just I don't think you'll have any trouble with it, okay? And uh, you can hold on to those. No! I had trouble with the, the homework quiz, so. It looks like this. You can't read that. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Um, do it when I can Do it when I can you. Do it when I can see you. I like to believe that you're going to hang on to that. Take notes. But I didn't Remember, have I found my algebra to you. Those were AP questions. AP test questions. The ones you just looked at? I'm still trying to find my. Yeah, there's those are weirdly structured questions, but they're there. Where so? Callie's saying that she had trouble understanding what was being asked here. It is weird. These are your choices, and then they're going to give you uh, combinations of different. One could be right, two, two and three. Um, yeah, and it, I think asking questions this way enables the, the test writers to ask fairly complex questions, questions that get at whether or not you understand the concepts. Okay, so they're kind of ask a question, answer it a few different ways, sort of, and then give you several different choices of, of you know, does, do these two go together, or is this is the, only, the only one that's true, and so on. So yeah, it is a. A weird way to ask a question, but it does happen. All right, so let's look at the, the homework, and um, do you have any questions? Uh, yeah, um, yeah. Why did it get from like No, don't do that. Ask a good question. Um, Time can we use now. Six on which um, section? 1.2. 1 1.2 1 number six? Yeah. Okay. I don't know. I just had issues with that. That shouldn't have been so hard, but I literally just sat there and like, stared at the calculator for like 10 minutes. Okay. It's good well, stuff. Um, and am I just like, supposed to be lazy to not do the calculator? Because I couldn't get it to go in six years. Like, okay. So if you just show me how to like, put it in there properly, then it should OK. Um, and we could do it by hand, but that, that would be That's a lot of time. Yeah. Well, you so, so, so you see. I know, but I can get it to go in the right way. Because I'm doing my error. You see there's square brackets there. Well, there's going to be an error at, at four. But you should be able to fill in that, uh, that table. I 
Okay, let's see what we can do. Um, well, there is the square brackets there. We're not going to use square brackets. We're just going to use parentheses. So we'll start the numerator. And the first part of the numerator they have is some kind of parentheses. X over X plus 1. So they have X over, and then in parentheses they have X plus 1, so that that's communicated to the calculator correctly. Okay, so that's right there. That closes this parentheses. So that closes like the square brackets in the problem we're looking at. So minus 4 fifths. Um, the, bra the brackets around 4 fifths is a little redundant, so we don't have to use that. Um, so that closes this parentheses divided by parentheses uh, x minus 4. x minus 4. So that ought to do it. Uh, look at the graph. Something weird. Two DOS table. So all we, yeah, all we need to do is look at the table. And let's see. We start at negative, or just. 3.9. Yep. 9, 3.99, 3.999. Okay. Looks like. What does it look like we're getting close to? 4. 4. 4.04. Okay, if we go past and go 4.000. We want to follow the book strictly and follow it, fill it in. Zero, zero, 001, 4.01, and 4.1. Yeah, definitely looks like on both sides we're approaching 0 0.04. Okay, so um, f of negative 2. So this is the function f. We want to know what is the, the value of the function of negative 2. And what is it? Nothing. 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 Yeah, it doesn't, doesn't exist. So f of negative 2 is undefined. Um, the limit as x approaches negative 2 here we are at negative 2, the limit as x approaches negative 2 doesn't exist, and why? Okay, an asymptote. All right, all right. But what about that, remember that AP question? Right. It still has an asymptote, but we could say informally that the limit is infinity, but is the limit infinity? No. Is it negative infinity? Now we're approaching two different infinities, so even if we like accepted infinity as a number in some way, still, uh, still doesn't work. Right? Approaching different values, so it doesn't exist. Let's see, f of zero. What is the function worth at zero? 
worth 4. We've got an open circle here, so that's not the function. The function is where we see the closed circle. f of 0 is 4. The limit as x approaches 0 of x does not exist. This doesn't exist. We've got a sa the same thing. They're approaching different values. We could just duplicate the response here. They're approaching different values. It's the exact same reason. F of 2. f of 2 does not exist, is, or it's, let's say it's undefined, is undefined. f limit as x approaches to 1. Um, yeah, this is a 1. If you look on your graphs, this looks like about a 0.5. It's a good enough guess. 0.5 looks to be on this side, it's coming down towards 0.5. Also, from over here, it's coming down towards 0.5. If we were to put numbers or x values into this function, we'd be getting 0 0.75, 0 0.6, 0 0.55. We'd just be getting closer and closer to 0 0.5, and the same on the other side. What's f of 4? It's like 2. That's what the function is actually worth at 2. And here comes h. h is the limit as x approaches 4. What could we say? Depends on how you want to say it. Really saying, well, what would it be? If I said it is equal to, what would it be equal to? Infinity. Infinity, um, but that's really just a way of communicating the, the actual technical limit does not exist. Okay. To say that it equals infinity is to say that it does not exist and to kind of give a reason. It just keeps on going towards infinity. <coughs> Maybe a couple more from the homework altogether. Um, uh, wait, I have one. from 1.2. Um, so it just wants us to sketch a graph that meets all the criteria here. So we'll draw a little graph. Black for plotting the graph. f of negative 2 is 0. What does that mean? When you say f of negative 2 is 0. Y is 0 at x equals negative 2. Y is 0 at negative 2 at x equals negative 2. So there we go. Right. Some of these things you can definitely just put on the graph. And others you're going to have to sketch and fill in. But this one's for sure. That means that there's a point negative 2 comma 0 on the graph. Um, f of 2 is 0. So the same thing is true at positive 2. The limit as x approaches negative 2 of f of x is 0. OK. So that might be something we need to keep in mind. Like maybe it's coming in from over here. and down here and the limit would definitely be zero there, or maybe it's coming across here. We need to get all the information so <coughs> that we know um, that that's okay to draw that. Um, the limit as x approaches two uh, does not exist, okay? So we need to, in some way, draw a function that at two, the limit does not exist. So it looks like we could just draw this. We could choose to have it look any way we want. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. The only other thing that we need to have on this graph is a limit that doesn't exist at 
uh, two. So how could that go? You can take a pro and make them all one, two. Oh, wait, never mind. Yeah, it could three. go, we can have a vertical asymptote. Yeah. This could go off to infinity. Yeah. And to be real safe and be Not sure backwards. that the limit does not exist here, what, what would we do on the other side? Go down. Yeah. Go down. So definitely the limit does not exist. They approach two different values. We could. There's another option, negative two, there, positive two. We could come down like that if we wanted to. Go up there, draw a hole there, hole there, or like that. The limit doesn't exist again. Beautiful. Any, anything that causes the limit not to exist, I think there's only those four things. K38, 1.3. So this is just, um, they, they want you to show that you got the point on page page 59, the first page, where they tell you the, the properties of limits, where if you add the limits of two functions, the limits add together. If you add, uh, or if you multiply them together, the limits multiply. If you multiply by a constant, a scalar, then the limit multiplies by a constant. So if we look at number 38, and limit as x approaches c is going to be given to us. And it's 3 halves. And there's this other function, g, where the limit as x approaches the same value, c, is 1 half. So if we were to imagine what this, these functions could possibly look like, uh, f could. Um, let's see, let's call this C, because it's like not told exactly what that is. Um, there's one, and two, so three halves is right there, so this function could look like that. And G of X, uh, the limit is one half, so it could look like this. It could actually have a hole there, but its limit is one half. It could even have this point right there. Um, so this value is 3 halves, this value is 1 half. Now keep in mind that the limit is from the right and from the left. We're seeing if they approach the same value from the right and from the left. But definitely that's true for f of x, the limit is 3 halves. g of x, the limit is uh, 1 half. And th this might be an example that they use, I don't know. But just let's say we were to add the functions together. Now all that means is we'll take the y values We'll add the y value to the y value to get the new function. So if, um, if I'm going to do f of x plus g of x, and maybe this new function we can call it h of x. If I was to add this y value to this y value, I would get something close to what? This y value to this y value. One. Close to one. I got something that's getting closer and closer to three halves and something else is getting closer and closer to 1 half, and so if we're to add those two values together, I get something that's getting closer and closer to 1. Okay. So h of x um, will look something like that uh, over here, and then on the right side, it's going to look uh, similar. Maybe it's going it's to go like this, and, and then when it gets to here, uh, it's going to go down, because now we're going to start adding negative values. right? So something, something like this, and it'll have a hole there because there's a hole here. There's nothing to add to here except for what we do is jump. This is uh, about three halves, and this is maybe negative two. So three halves plus negative two, now that's gonna be like down here. Okay. That doesn't matter. It only matters what's happening on the right and on the left. So that's just one example where we add the functions together. What's the limit of this new function as x approaches c? What's it getting close to? On C. On the left. On the left of C. What values are we getting as we come up from the left on this function? Near three halves. Near three halves. And on this one, near what? One half. Near one half. So these values on the left uh, on the green function, they're approaching. We add the three halves plus the one half. 
two. You said one. You said one earlier. It's getting close to two. And on the right, there's values here that are a little bit bigger than three halves, but they're getting close to three halves. Here, close to one half. So we're adding something that's close to three halves, plus something that's close to one half. So we're gonna have something that's close to two, a little bigger than two, but close to two. So this limit of this new function is just this limit plus this limit. Three halves plus one half is two. And there's, there's several other properties um, like, where did I go? 38. Four. So part A, the limit as x approaches c of 4 times f of x. Well, here's f of x, just a, an imagined possible graphical representation of f. And here's what we're doing. We're, we're creating like this new function that is 4 times bigger than f of x. That means every point on f of x is going to get, every y value is going to get multiplied by what? 4. four. So it's going to be 4 times steep. 4 times steeper. And every value will be 4 times higher. Right? 4 times higher than this function. So we're going to go, we're going to multiply this by 4. And we're going to go up there. It's going to multiply by 4. That's going to be very, very high. You know, much higher than, than these two compared to each other. But also, right here, the values near C are also going to get multiplied by 4. They're going to be 4 times higher. Right? So you're going to take values that are close to 3 halves, multiply them by 4. So now you're going to be approaching values that are 4 times bigger than 3 halves. So all that you really need to think of is 4 times the limit as x approaches c of f of x. We know what the limit is as x approaches c. What is the limit as x approaches c for f? 3 halves. 3 halves, 4 times 3 halves, 6. Beautiful. B. Okay, we're going to add them together. We already looked at this one. Think about what we do when we take a limit. And we're evaluating this limit if we, if we had a function to plug values into. We just plug it in values that are close to C. And the closer and closer we get to C, the values of x as they get closer and closer to C, the value of the function gets arbitrarily close to 3 halves. So this part is getting close to what? <coughs> what value is this approaching as x gets close to C? Three halves. Three halves. What is this getting close to? One, One, One half. half. So the value of them added together is two. Two. Karen? You get the question for A is it sexy by a G of X. I G of X? I G of X. No, I'm the thirty-eight. Oh, then what was I looking at? Not that I wouldn't make that mistake, but I didn't today. I've got thirty seven the whole time, except I used the two. I used the same F of X and G of X. Oh, I've done that. That's okay. It'll be okay. It's okay. the exact same thing except for the first one, so I'm okay. Okay, here the, the idea here is pretty much the same as multiplying by a scalar. All we're doing is taking the y values of okay. f and multiplying by the y values of g. And whatever they are, the, the, the product is going to be this many times higher than whatever this value is. This, as x gets close to c, as we put the values that are closer and closer to c, this is getting close to what? Three halves. Three halves. This is getting close to? One half. We know that from just the given information. We don't know that for any other reason than they just told us that at the beginning of the problem. So this is three halves. This is getting close to one half. So the result is getting close to three halves times one half because we're multiplying them together. And so we're getting three fourths. And lastly, part D. Uh, f of x over g. If we look at these separately, f of x, as x gets, as values of, of x get plugged in here that are closer and closer to c, this will get close to 3 halves, this will get close to 1 half, so we have 3 halves divided by 1 half, multiplied by the reciprocal, and so we get a 3. Let's pass that in. Oh, girl, did you get that table? Oh, 
It says write a simple function that agrees with the given function at all but one point. That's how we're starting today. So first, let's let's just talk about this. Um, so there's these four theorems: theorem 1.3 through 1.6, and let's see. So what you'll notice about all these functions is they're telling us the limit as x approaches c of some kind of function is p of c, meaning that you just plug c into the function. So that, that happens. Here that happens. The, the limit as x approaches uh, r of x, which is defined as one function divided by another, these are polynomial functions, uh, is equal to just plugging c into the function. And we're just plugging c into this function. We're plugging c into the sine, into the tangent, into the secant, and so on. Okay? There are these, these functions that are nice to work with that we can just plug whatever the x value is into the function. So it's saying, if you have a function that looks like this, say at, at c, and it just goes right through it, there's no holes, no vertical asymptotes, there's <coughs> no undefined values, it's all hunky-dory, and you just plug c into the function, because if you plug in c, and you get out this value, on the right, we must be approaching that y value, and on the left we must be approaching that y value, because we know about this function. We know it's like this nice, well-behaved function. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. For a function like, for a function like x squared, we're not going to have any issues like holes or vertical asymptotes. There's not going to really even be any place where the limit doesn't exist. The limit's going to exist, and you know what? It's going to be the same as if you just plugged in anything you want into x squared. So this is the limit as x approaches 3 of x squared. There's no need to get out a table and plug in 2.9 and 2.99 and 2.001 or 3.001 and 
There's no point, in, in, there's no need to do that because we can just plug three in there and we have something we know about x squared. This is nice, smooth, continuous parabola that is not gonna have a value of the function that's different from the limit at that x value. So it's just three squared. So any function that's, that's nice like that, let's call it well-behaved, is one where you can just plug in the x value, whatever the x value is, and that would be the same as the limit. So this is just outlining all the different kinds of functions that will do that. Uh, polynomial functions. We talked about a polynomial function before. Anything that's got x values to uh, constant powers, with maybe some coefficients out in front here, something out in front like that. Um, and then that's the, the structure of the, of the whole thing, just x's raised to powers. We know that those graphs just look something like this. This could be the graph of a polynomial. Maybe a, maybe a six degree polynomial. But everywhere on this graph, the limit exists, and you can just plug in the x value to find the limit. It's just direct substitution. Okay. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Are the stairs that I'm repeating myself or that you're confused? You kind of want stairs. Is there confusion or you're wanting me to just move on? Move on? Who votes for move on? I get it. It's clear. Okay. Okay. Um, so there's polynomial functions. Here's rational functions. Um, so rational function is a polynomial over a polynomial, so that should work, right? Both of the polynomials are going to be well-behaved functions. The only thing is if this bottom function does what? Zero. zero. Zero, that can't be, right? So it just says, as long as Q of C is not zero, then it works. You can just plug the X value into the function. We definitely want to get to that place where we're just plugging the X value into the function rather than constructing a table or looking at a graph or what have you. Okay. So rational functions work, uh, root functions work. Um, if it's an odd root, for sure that'll work. Right? We just did that with x to the one third power. Okay. Same thing as third root of x. Mm -hmm. okay. Fifth root of x, seventh root of x, these all work really well because you can take the seventh root or the ninth root or some odd root of negative numbers. That's okay, right? Um, what if this is an even root? When do, when do you have trouble? Like what C values would cause trouble in an even root? Negative. Negative numbers, all right? So then C would just have to be a positive number, which is what this is saying. C is greater than zero. You see what they're doing? They're just defining these functions that are, quote, well behaved, and they're making sure that the C values are such that you don't wind up getting a denominator of zero or an even root of a negative number. Same thing for these trig functions. Uh, particularly for sine and cosine. Sine is nice, it's just this, this wave. Nice continuous wave, goes on forever in both directions, no holes, no gaps, no vertical asymptotes. So, you can just plug the x value right into the function and whatever you get out, that must be the limit because on the left and the right, it's just, they're just gonna be coming in at some point on that wave. Cosine, same thing. But all these guys, tangent, cotangent, secant, and cosecant, it says, let C be a real number in the domain of the given trigonometric <coughs> function. All values, all x values are in the domain of sine and cosine. Anything goes. But tangent, it's not so much, because how do you find the tangent? Sine over cosine. Sine over cosine, right? So if the cosine turns out to be zero, now we have an issue. So wherever the cosine is zero, we're not in the domain of tangent. Well, it'll be a vertical asymptote in this case. Okay, and you know, the reverse is true for cotangent. It's cosine over sine, so if there's a place where the sine is equal to zero, the cotangent is gonna have a vertical asymptote, so we're not gonna have a limit. And the same for the secant and the cosecant, because that's one over cosine and this is one over sine. Okay. And so all they're saying is, Look for opportunities, basically. Look for opportunities to just plug the value of x into the function rather than having to look at a table or the graph and use trace or 
having to plug these values in by hand or something like that. Okay. I'm going to plug it in right into the function. So what we're going to be doing is trying to find a way to turn functions that we have that are problematic into functions like these that work, that we can just plug a number into. Okay. So we might run into a function that winds up putting a negative into an even root. We're going to try and fix that. We might run into a function where there's a zero in the denominator. We're going to try and fix that. We're going to try and fix all these problems. So let's take a kind of a simple example. Let's start with. x squared plus x minus 6 over x plus 3. That is a polynomial. This is also a polynomial. They're just two polynomials. And polynomials are well behaved, and they're nice. And you should be able to just plug the x value in for any value of x. Unless what happens? Zero in the denominator. Zero in the denominator. And what x value would cause that to happen? Negative 3. Negative 3. So what do you think the limit is that we want to find? Of course, it's going to be negative 3. All other limits are going to be kind of boring. We just plug in the x value and have no issue. Let's take our graphing calculators and look at the graph of this function. What do you think this looks like? If you were to just guess. Parabola. Parabola is a good guess. It got an x squared there. And maybe this just kind of makes it look a little weird at some places. X plus 3 does. Maybe it causes a vertical asymptote or something. Uh, so I like it. We have a guess. Let's plug it in and see what it looks like. X minus 6 divided by X plus 3. So now we look at the graph. Okay, well, does it look like a parabola on that screen? No. no. Maybe if it does look like a parabola, what? How could we see the parabola? Maybe zoom out. Zoom, zoom out. Maybe we need to zoom way out. Zoom out. There will be good. No. We zoomed down a lot. Let's see what these. Uh, well, let's see what we can hit the window here. It went to negative forty to forty, and so it it's like four times bigger now. Do you think it would start? You'd start to see the curve of the parabola if this was a parabola at this screen? Yeah. You get to zoom out more? No? I wouldn't hope so. You would hope so? I wouldn't hope so. Wouldn't hope so. You would hope not. You hope you don't need to zoom out. Okay. So what does it look like this graph is? A line. A line. But that seems weird because this graph of this, this function over here looks funkier than a line. The equation of a line. Yeah. Somehow the square gets canceled out, right? If we, if we, like, the parabola comes from a degree two, and if somehow that square got canceled out, it's kind of a, a weird, like, how would that work? But, but maybe that's what happens, like, gets canceled out so that what's left is a degree one, and that's a line. It does uh, look negative three. What's that? It does look negative three. Nine minus nine, doesn't it? So what are you saying? Well, if you plugged in negative 3 for all the x's, yes. it would be 9 for the x squared minus 9. 9 minus 3. It would be 0 over 0. This would be 9 minus 3 minus, minus six. 6. OK, that's where you get your 9 minus 9. Put in the negative 3 the negative 6. Uh, yeah, so you get 0 over 0. And just a reminder about something we talked about last year. If you get 0 over 0, we talked about this before with vertical asymptotes and holes, you get 0 over 0. Where, what do you have at that point on the graph? A hole. Rather than, what else could you have besides a hole? An asymptote, a vertical asymptote. If you plug in this value and you get 0 divided by 0, that's a surefire way to confirm there's a hole rather than a vertical asymptote. OK? So it looks like what we have is a line with what? A hole. A hole. Where? Negative, Negative 3. When you put in negative 3, you get 0 on a numerator denominator. Let's look. Uh, maybe we'll zoom back regularly. Zoom 6 takes us back to the standard window. And uh, if we did trace and we did negative 3, we can see 
we get no y value. It's not defined. If we did trace and we just kind of move towards negative 3, fortunately, if there's a way to do it, I don't know how to make it skip from here right on to negative 3. But what would we see if we could get, if we could just bump this a little bit and make this cursor land right at x equals negative 3? Mm -hmm. um, okay, error would be like a something reasonable, something we'd expect to happen. What the, what the calculator actually does um, is something similar. If we could jump right onto negative 3, we just don't get anything out at all. It doesn't say error, but it doesn't give us any output. If we were to look at the table, we put in negative 3. Not surprisingly, there we'll find that we get an error. Okay. But it seems like everywhere else besides negative 3, this just acts like a line. Is there an equation for that line? What is the equation? X plus 2? X minus 2? Okay. Looks like you were looking at that. Fine. So how did you, what are you doing there? Okay. So, <laughs> let's, let's just say that was a guess. Let's say that's a lucky guess. It's not. It's a good calculation. But we can even look here at the graph and see there's a y-intercept of negative 2. We can see it looks like it goes through 2. That'd be a slope of 1. It looks like negative x uh, plus 2, or x plus, x minus 2. Um, slope of 1, minus of, of negative 2. So let's just, let's say we were to guess that. x minus 2, if we're right about this being the equation of that line, what's going to happen when I hit graph? Well, what will, what will we see? Yeah, this graph's going to be there still, and the second graph just goes right, right on top of it with the difference of uh, that's not what I wanted. I'll trace. Okay. Well, we don't want to use this function. We want to use the x minus 2. So we press it down. And so now we're on x minus 2. And we go to negative 3. And look at that. Negative 5. Okay. Well, at all other values, these functions are the same. They're the same function. They agree at every other value, right? Except here. So. What does this function have that this one doesn't? Denominator. Denominator. But what the actual graph itself? As a whole. As a whole, where this one does not. Right? This one kind of uh, fills in the whole of this one. It's like this, this graph with the whole filled in. Now, is this function the same as this function? No. no. Why? It's not part of the whole. As a whole. If there's some way that they differ, they're not the same. Right? In every other way, they're the same. But at negative 3, there's a hole in this one and not in this one. So they're not the same function. But what is the same about these two functions in the context of the thing that we've been talking about? Slope. They agree the at every other the point. What's that? They agree at every other point. They agree at every other point, except for that one, right? So if they agree at every other point except for that one, what do they have in common? Thing that we really are trying to find that we care about. Uh, the limit. Their limits. All of their limits are the same. Uh, all of their limits must be the same. The functions are different, but their limits are the same. So I couldn't say that x squared plus x minus 6 over x plus 3. Well, I could say this x minus 2 times x plus 3. Is that correct? Just factored it, factored or quadratic. x plus 3, OK? Are these the same thing? I haven't done anything. All I do is factor that. You're still going to get the same outputs there. But when I go like this, can I now say they're equal? No, they're not the same. But what I could do is I could just move this over a little bit, squeeze in something else, the limit as x approaches whatever you want is equal to the limit as x approaches that same thing. So their limits are the same. They're not the same function, but their limits are the same. So when we talk about uh, functions that agree at every other point, we're really just talking about how this function, in essence, fills in the holes of this function. Okay. Now, 
that's all it's going to have. This function isn't going to like fix vertical asymptotes, let's say. They're going to have the same vertical asymptotes. They're just going to have holes filled in. Because the only way that you can have a hole is to have a common factor like this. That's why we get 0 over 0. Because when you put negative 3 in here and negative 3 in here, you get 0 times that is 0 over 0. That's why, that's why when you plug that in, you get 0 over 0. That's why there's a hole. But in this function, these factors of x plus 3 are essentially are like doing nothing. They're adding nothing to the output that this didn't already get. Does that make sense? Yeah? No? This gets an output of, of whatever it gets, x minus 2. You plug it on x, and you subtract 2 from it. Okay. Well, when you put the x in here and the x in here, all that happens is you get the same factor. They cancel each other out. And all you're left with is whatever you did when you subtracted 2 from that number. The limits are exactly the same. So that's the key right there. That's how we're going to take uh, a limit, especially this limit, and get it so that we can let h go to 0. We can find out what the limit would be when, like at the, the point that h is 0. But we're going to use a different function, a function that agrees with this one at all but one point. And it'll tell us what the limit is, and therefore the slope that we were looking for in the beginning. Okay. We just have to learn all that stuff. We have to learn all the different ways that you can uh, eliminate a hole. Find a function that agrees at all at one point. Yeah. So what's one way displayed by this problem? Factor. Factor out a polynomial so that one of the factors comes out and is the same as the factor <laughs> Okay, so let's give that some practice. Um, let's do 46 and 48.
Okay? So we'll sum our 46 together. If this were any other x value besides negative 1, we could just plug it in. 0, 1, 2, 3 halves, whatever. The thing that happens though when we plug in negative 1 is we get a 0 in the denominator. So what we're going to do is get rid of that problem, get rid of that hole. So you can see we get 0 over 0 when we plug in negative 1. So that's our first strategy is we're going to just factor out the numerator and then hopefully that it, it cancels out with the denominator. I'm going to factor a polynomial. It looks like that. Factor quadratic specifically. You get those two parentheses. You got an x term here and an x term here. You know that's true because you've got to multiply these together to get an x squared. But right now, all we get is an x squared. We need to get what? 2x squared. 2x squared. How do we change it? Put a 2 in front of either one. Put one right there. So now we get a 2x squared. That's good. Okay. So that's taken care of. The next part we move on to is the constant because that's also fairly simple. The only way to get the constant is to multiply two constants. So we just look at this constant and this constant. It doesn't have to inter interact with the x's at all. We can multiply these two numbers together to get negative 3. There's lots of different possibilities. Well, it's only a, a 1 and a 3 and a negative. So there's like four possibilities. Right? You can put a positive 3 or negative 3 here or a positive 1 or a negative 1 there. So we got four different possibilities. So why not just start somewhere, so x minus 3, x plus 1, and see 2x squared, negative 3 times 1 is negative 3, negative 3x plus 2x is negative x, okay, our first guess was good. Also, um, what we're doing here is we're hoping that when we get done, what happens? cancels out. This guy right here, there's only a factor of x plus 1, so probably if it's going to work out the way we want, there's going to need to be an x plus 1 factor, so that informs our guess as well. And it all works out, and x plus 1 cancels with x plus 1, and so this limit is the same as this limit of just what's left over, 2x minus 3. We plug in negative 1, and get negative 2 minus 3, negative 5. And that's what we found in our graphing calculators, right? Is it the same one? No, it's a different one. Mm -hmm. There you go. Okay, 48, really similar. A little different. x cubed plus 1 over x plus 1. x plus 1. Limit as x approaches negative 1. Then we have a problem there. In both the numerator and denominator, we would get 0. Back to this third degree polynomial, we have to recognize that it's a special pattern called sum of cubes. If you didn't realize in the back of your book on the little thick cardboard page um, on the left side of it, right? not the side of the shapes and stuff, there's several different polynomial things. And one of them is the special pattern x cubed plus a cubed. It says x cubed plus a cubed equals x plus a times x squared minus 2ax plus a squared. Right? Wait, it just says minus ax, not 2ax. Minus ax. Um, so now we just fill in for x. Well, x is going to be x, and a is going to be what? One. one, because this happens to be one cube. So x plus one times x squared minus x plus one. Over x plus one. Cancels those out. I should be writing limit, because the functions aren't equal to each other, just the limits themselves. And now that we've removed that hole, right? this is a new function, not the same as that function, but their limits are the same. We put in a negative 1, 1 plus 1 plus 1 is 3.
Yeah. So on 45 through 48, it says like find the limit of the function that says if it exists. Mm -hmm. But do you want us to do that like after we find the simpler? Um, equation of it? You could find the limit without finding the, sim the, the other function that agrees at all but one point by using the graphic calculator. I think it would be faster to just go ahead and factor it out and, and see if something cancels. It doesn't have to cancel. Well, we, could, we could put two polynomials together, one over the other, but you factor them both, and they don't share anything in common, and the denominator is still zero, mm -hmm. right? And so that doesn't fix the problem, and the limit just doesn't exist. Yeah, but with the, like before you did it, would they all reach an error with it? Like for 45, it says limit as x equals negative one. Right, so if we were to use our calculators, that would look like uh, putting the function in, looking at the table, plugging the values that are close to the x value and seeing what we're getting close to. Oh, okay. um, okay. Okay, and it's all very similar for lots of other problems. Um, example number 52, uh, we would have to factor both the numerator and the denominator and find that factor that's causing a zero in the denominator and the numerator. Um, what, let's look at there. If we're having trouble with four, what's that factor going to be? X minus four. X minus four, because we're going to put a four in there for x, we're going to subtract four from four and get to zero. So use that to, to help you along. Make sure you're factoring it correctly, but that should help you along. Okay, so now something like 53. So if this problem is fixable, we're again going to get 0 divided by 0. So we plug in 0, it's square root of 5, minus the square root of 5, that's 0. And of course, when you put 0 in there, you just get 0. So there we go. We have, we have that issue. But there's no factoring this, right? You're not going to factor conjugate. this out like you what? Conjugates. You multiply by the conjugate. What's the conjugate? What's the con it's not like it wasn't going to be true if she didn't say it. What's, what's the conjugate of this? Square root of x, square root of x plus, 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 square plus square root of x. Square root of x. Yeah. Oh my, oh my. So we multiply by the conjugate, square root of x plus 5 plus the square root of 5 over the square root of x plus 5 plus the square root of 5. Well, that's good. <laughs> Well, the thing about multiplying conjugates is you just get this term times this term minus this term times this term. Because when you multiply the middle terms together, you get identical terms, except, well, you get exact opposites, so they just cancel each other out. So you get the square root of x plus 5 times the square root of x plus 5. What's that? x plus 5. Right. OK, and this is a negative times a positive, so we're going to get minus square root of 5 times square root of 5. 5. It's 5. Over, let's not try and like distribute this, let's just leave it as x times the square root of x plus 5 plus the square root of 5. Well, look at that. Mm -hmm. Cancel those out. Uh, oh, so, I, mean, I should really be writing the limit because if I don't write the limit, what I'm writing isn't true. Yeah. So now this is the limit as x approaches 0 of x over x times x, the square root of x plus 5 plus the square root of 5. And from Connor, it's hard to cancel out an x, so we're just going to cancel out. This x will be a different color. The limit as x approaches 0, 1 over the square root of x plus 5, plus the square root of 5. So now, plug a 0 in there, we get the square root of 5 plus the square root of 5. So that limit is 1 over 2 root 5. Rationalize it. Rationalize it. What will it be? Uh, root 5. Oh gosh. Root 5 over 10. Over ten. Yes. Yeah. Two. So root five. Yeah. Root five. Yep. Here we get root five. Here we get. Okay. Right, root five. Here we get five times two. Yeah. Simplify. Yep. Will you go back? No simplifying. That's it. <laughs> yes. Go back and do. Like, Glad you were joking. The first. Go back to here. Yes. Here. How you get from 
How do you get gets two back? Okay. Uh, so I did it. What I what I did was to say, when we multiply conjugates together, here let me let me show you with a simple conjugate, a plus b, a minus b, right? Any two conjugates, this is going to happen. A times A, the first thing times the first thing, right? First thing times the first thing. You get the first thing squared. All right. Let's look at the end. Okay, at the end, we're going to get B times negative B, the second thing, right? The second thing times the opposite of the second thing. It's going to be negative second thing squared. Okay? In the middle, what we're going to get is A times negative B, so that's negative AB. And A times positive B, positive AB. Those two cancel out. So that happens every time you multiply conjugates together. You get the first thing squared, first thing squared, minus the second thing squared. So first thing squared is x plus 5, second thing squared is 5, x plus 5 minus 5. Yeah? How did you get rid of the x unknown square? And then the. Which one? On the last line. The x right there. Oh, because we just plugged zero in oh, there okay. for x. Right, that's what we're doing. We're getting these functions that agree at all but one point so that you can plug the zero in. At first, we tried to plug zero in here, and we had a problem, and that's what we were fixing. Um, why did you pass out the plus five minus five? Because five minus five is just zero. So you can multiply by a conjugate. So consider those two possibilities. Try factoring. Now, we could factor a polynomial. We could also factor a trig function that's in the form of a quadratic. So you could factor that. Maybe you got like sine squared minus 1. And sine plus 1 times sine minus 1. Think about that. Um, but then again, maybe you're going to want to, like if you have sine squared plus 1, that's not a difference of squares, it's not going to factor like a quadratic. So maybe sine squared plus 1, or maybe, maybe it's sine plus 1. Maybe you multiply sine plus 1 times sine minus 1. Multiply with a conjugate. If you still want to up with a sine squared, that could be useful. Right? So play around with that uh, as, you're, as you're thinking about that. Okay? If you see square roots, good chance you're going to want to multiply with a conjugate. Okay? So think factoring, think multiply by the conjugate. Those two things. Yeah. Let's see what we can do here. Okay, now we'll be getting into the idea of continuity, um, what it means for a function to be continuous everywhere, and what it means to be discontinuous at some specific place. So what I'm going to have you take home is just a really um, informal definition of continuity. I'm just going to get us to the first few, um, and then we'll talk about one side of them. It's the, the more strict definition of continuity. So if you were to look at a function, maybe I'll, I'll just draw some, some made up functions. Okay, 
So there's, there's four different functions, let's say. Let's break them up. Can you put it right in the middle? Huh? Take that function right in the middle. No, not that. Just break it up. Uh, so how many of these functions would you say, just based on your understanding of the word continuous and how you would use it in a sentence, how many of these functions are continuous? One. 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 Right. How could we define a function that is continuous? No holes. Right. No, no holes. No asymptotes. No asymptotes. No gaps. Okay. Same point. Huh? Like meets at the same point. Okay, now we're getting into the, the more technical definition about limits and from the right and from the left. Okay, so we'll talk about that, but we just don't have enough time to talk about it that formally. But let's um, just informally still, if I had a continuous function, I could draw it without doing what? Picking up your pen, picking up your pencil. So that's a nice, like a pictorially defined uh, definition of, of continuity. We'll get into more specifics. Um, and I didn't write your homework up there. Is anybody needing to write it down right now, or can they just get it off the website for text? Is this the text doesn't work for? Is it just the last part? Okay. It's the last part of that, and then, well, yeah, I guess that's not too bad. Then I have 1.4, just a few more, because that, tar that starts uh, continuity. Text. Yeah, it looks like just 1 through 6. 1.4, 1 through 6. I know, I really got it. I'm just going to keep it.